You know, over the last number of months, as you know, I'm being the lean pastor here. I'm also at Cambria Vineyard Church right now, winding down my tenure there. And so I've been back and forth, and uh, I've been back there the last number of weeks. I'm gonna be with you the next three weeks, including today. I can't wait till I can be here, uh, you know, uh, full time. And I'm looking forward to that by the end of the summer, first of, of September. And um, next week, though, we are gonna do something really special. We're gonna have a family Sunday, and we're gonna have a communion Sunday. And so we're gonna have the kids in, and we, it's gonna be a special time together. And I encourage you to come and join us as we kind of have a family celebration and see what God has, has for us. And uh, last week, got a chance to, 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 uh, to watch Anne-Marie talking about the presence of God. And boy, is that ever critical for us, amen? God's presence is, is, is such a, a, an important asset of everything we are and everything that we do in that. So anyway, I've been thinking about what, what can I emphasize, what can I talk about over the next um, few months when I'm back and forth. And what, what came to my mind is, I wanna to talk to you about values and principles. I'm a, a value and principle-centered leader. I, I'm very missional, and, and I love strategy, and I love vision, but more than anything, I, I want to impart to you values and, and principles of, of the scriptures of which we can, we can live by. The best asset in this church are people. It's not our program, it's not our building, how beautiful it is, and looking outside, this is fantastic. But our, our asset as a church is it's, is it's people, not our programs or our services. It's about you and I living an authentic, not perfect, but an authentic life following, following Jesus and how to live in his kingdom. And I wanna talk about that. I wanna build a culture that, that, we, that we live in. And Jesus established that. I wanna establish a culture here, a culture of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Let me say it again. A culture of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. That's exactly what Jesus promoted. He said, love one another as I've loved you. Accept one another as I've accepted you. And forgive one another as I have forgiven you. When we walk in those realities, I tell you what, people will flock to a place where they find that there's a safe place that they can come and just dump whatever it is that they are and come as they are and experience God in that way. So, so today in our, in our time left, I wanna talk about how to lose our religion. How to lose our religion. Someone once said that religion is actually us trying to reach out to God, but Christian faith is God reaching out to us. Religion is, is striving and seeking, and it's about believing right and, and acting right, behaving right, and trying harder. You ever get tired of that? It was like, you, you just gotta try harder to please God, and no matter what you do, it's, it's not quite enough. Always striving, but never arriving. That's what religion does. Kind of puts you in that box of a treadmill. Always striving, but never arriving. And personally, I have a bias. You might as well know it. That I hate religion that keeps people away from Jesus. I hate it. I was in Israel, and I was in the, the old city, and they had a Christian quarter, a Muslim quarter, and a Jewish quarter. Walking around, and I was disillusioned because it was empty everywhere, including the Christian quarter. And I was just like, God, what, what is happening here? And it was that, almost that spirit of religion that was over, at, you know, over the city and over, over the people and going through the motions and all the rest of it, and yet people are desperate for God and didn't, and didn't know him, and it really impacted me. Jesus faced this in his day with the Pharisees. He got in trouble all the time because he didn't do God right. Because he cared about people and he reached out to people that were unacceptable or the untouchables of that day. What really infuriated the religious leaders of his time was his crazy habit of throwing open the doors of his love to the whosoevers, the just anyone, and the not a chancers. Really, Jesus, them? Well, I don't know about you, but if, you know, the not, the not a chancers, that would have been me. 
And Jesus made room for me and he's making room for you, making room for you, and he's making room for others. And so I think to engage our, our city and our culture that we need, to, we need to lose our religion and we need to put on Jesus. And I'm gonna give some contrast to that. So sometimes Jesus and his disciples, they opted out of some of the rules and some of the accepted religious practices. And I wanna talk about one of them. It was customary for religious leaders um, and devoted Jews to wash, do a ceremonial washing at the end of the day to wash off the contamination that they might have been around people that were unclean, that somebody would have touched them that, you know, or they would have had contact with them. And so when Jesus and his disciples sat down, the Pharisees were there, he didn't have his disciples washed. And this is what went down in Mark 7. It says, so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? instead of eating their food with unclean hands. It doesn't mean they had filthy, dirty hands. It was a ceremonial thing. It had nothing to do with that where they didn't wash before their meal. And Jesus replied with starking. He said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, speaking of the Pharisees. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Jesus put it right, right on the table here. Why didn't Jesus have his disciples go through the ceremonial washing? I have an idea. I think he didn't do that because Jesus did not see people as dirty or unclean, something they need to wash off from. That was not his perspective. That's not how we saw people that were out in the marketplace that were broken and dealing with all the things of life. He didn't see them as something they need to wash off of themselves. And that was the problem that Jesus had. Your focus is on the rules and my focus is on people. You see, religious, religion says, obey the rules. And Jesus says, love me and people. To love people. An example I came across about a father trying to teach his daughters about this is very poignant. And I want to read it to you. Trying to help his daughters understand about what matters most, what's important to God. And so he gets his daughters together and says, suppose you got a wonderful new dress for an upcoming wedding you were going to. Because you liked it so much, you begged me to wear it early the next day at school rather than having to wait for the weekend wedding? What if I told you that you could only wear your new dress if you obey one simple rule? You must not get the dress dirty. Under no circumstances can you get that dress dirty. Would that be a fair rule? And they agreed, yeah, that would be, that would be right. Then... What if you set out for school the next day with your new dress only to come across a friend who had fallen off her bike and landed in a muddy ditch? What if your friend was hurt and needed help? What would you do? The answer came back quick. We should help her. But that would mean that your dresses would get completely dirty, the dad said. That doesn't matter as much, they said. Helping our friend is more important. Are you sure, the dad said, what about the rule? What do you think my reaction would be if you came home from school dirty from head to toe in your new dress? And their response was, you'd be proud of us for doing the right thing. You'd be proud of us for doing the right, the right thing. In Jesus' day, and sometimes even today, religious leaders sometimes are focused on keeping their clothes clean rather than helping people. I'm gonna give you some, some news. Church should be messy. It shouldn't be nice and tidy. It should be messy. Can you guess why? Because people are messy. Because life is messy. And somehow we've created a message you know, you know, come as you get cleaned up and come and be part of us. 
and we want everybody to fit in. We want it all to be nice, but sometimes people in, and they don't have it working together. You know, they, they don't know the rules. They don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to do God. They don't know how to life. And sometimes it was like, ooh, let them in. We, there was a season in our church in Colorado, there were these group of teenagers, and one of our young guys was leading tons of them to Jesus. And they hung out in this coffee shop, and they all wore black, and you know, black tattoo, tattoos and all kinds of, they, they were a different kind of group. And they started filling up rows in, in our church. And, uh, and I loved it. I thought, this is so good. But they were messy. They didn't know how to behave. One guy brought us pet rat, had it on a leash. That was good. But I was, I'm, I'm speaking, and I'm watching this rat going up and down, and, and people are doing the same thing. They're not paying any attention to me. This guy's got his rat on a chain. You know, it's like, and uh, it was during that same time, some parents came up to me that had their kids in our church, and they said, we have a problem with these kids that are coming to our church and our kids connecting with them. And I said, really? So what are you saying? It says, well, if, if, you're gonna, if they're gonna be part of here, I don't know if we can be here, that I think you've made your decision, that you need to find another church probably. I've very seldom ever said that to anybody. But it was putting on the line that you're saying, I'm not comfortable with people like that in our church around my kids. And if you're asking me to choose, I'm choosing them. And it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because we became known as a church that anybody could come to. It's come as you are, not stay as you are, but anybody could come to the vineyard. That was the byline for our church. And people dared to come because they were told it was a safe place they didn't have to fix themselves up for at first. That they could bring their messes into our church. And the fact is, we were all messes at different levels. And so that was, that, you know, this story is very, very powerful. Jesus does care more about people. He said, you know, all the commandments, all the rules, it's summed up and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That sums it all up. That's what matters most to me. And I so want that for us. Religion also says, in another sense, not on this day. Jesus says, my way is every day. They had this thing called the Sabbath, was, was for God's people to rest. On the seventh day, God rested, and he provided the Sabbath for his people to rest. But over time, the Sabbath became more and more of a ritual, of a tradition, that you don't do anything, even, even good things. The Bible says that at the end of the day that people were not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for people. It was for us to find rest. We need a Sabbath, but they had made it something, something else. So Jesus had a, a moment in, a, in, a, in the synagogue that I want to share with you in Mark 3. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. And since it was the Sabbath, here we go, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. See, they knew something. They probably planted the guy with a withered hand in, in the assembly of people there. And they just knew that Jesus couldn't keep his hands off. He couldn't just let it go, that he was gonna do something. We're gonna see if he dares to heal this person on the Sabbath. And so literally, they were planning to accuse him. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. He said, you talk about a messy moment. He said, do you think this is a problem? Come here, stand in front of everyone. And then he turned to his critics and he asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. And he looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. And then he said to the man, hold out your hand. And so the man held out his hand and it was restored. Thank you, Jesus. And at once the Pharisees went away praising God and thanking God for this. No, they didn't at all. At once, 
This is, what the, this is what religion does and the spirit of religion does. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. They could care less that a man with a deformed hand was healed. He didn't do it the way we think you should do it. You know, we gotta be careful, folks. Sometimes we can judge different people because of styles and things are going on and that's not God, that's not how it should be. It's like, wait a minute, we need to rejoice when God works in people's lives, no matter whether it's through us or in a different stream or, or whatever it might, might be. But it's a heartbreak. They could care less that the man was healed because your tradition, your rules were being broken and that mattered more to you than this man that was suffering and is now healed. Lastly, religion says some people are beyond hell. We just, we can't deal with you. Jesus says, no one is too far gone. No one is too far gone. Aren't you glad? Come on, aren't you glad for that? Because if that wasn't true, you wouldn't be here. Because most of us, we were too far gone in the world's eyes, in people's eyes, that somebody has given up on you. But God doesn't give up on you. You can't get him to quit. You can't get him to say no to you. And it's a powerful thing. There was one time where Jesus had an encounter with the leprosy, which is the untouchables, the ones that were too far gone. Let me read it to you in Matthew 8. It said, large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. And suddenly a man with leprosy approached him. Oh, no and knelt before him. These guys were considered, if you touch a leper, you get, you get contaminated and you get their disease. And we found out later on, it's not, it wasn't that true. And he knelt before the Lord. He said, what are you thinking? Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing. There it is. I am willing. And he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. I find it interesting in this passage, when Jesus healed people, he did it differently in, in every time. Sometimes he just spoke the word. But this time he touched the leper. And I, and I wondered why. And I think that leper, the untouchable, had probably, I wonder how long it's been since he felt a human touch. He needed more than a healing word and, and being restored. But the fact that Jesus would teach, would touch him was maybe the greater healing for him. You see, if you were a leper, everybody had given up and ostracized you. You lived outside the city in a leper colony. That's how it worked. And then the Levitical laws demanded that a person with leprosy live outside the town and you wouldn't, and people couldn't come within six feet of you. How would you like to be that one? And if anybody approached you, you had to, you had to, to uh, cry out, unclean, unclean. Don't come to me. Don't get around me. I'll contaminate you. You can't get near me. That's who they were. And that's how a lot of people feel today. And then Jesus touched the unthinkable and reached out and touched the man. And the crowd must have gasped. It's like, oh my gosh, what are you doing here? Sometimes we hear with somebody, don't bother with them. You're wasting your time. I heard that so many times. I even had people say, I had given my, in my early days, we ran a Christian coffee house and I'd spend hours and hours with people that didn't change. Wouldn't give up their drugs or whatever. And it's just, I did not waste my time. Some, there was a time I thought I did. I did not waste my time because I didn't get the result I wanted. That person desired, that was worthy of my time and my reaching out. And it's up to them what they, what they do with it. But they hear that you're too far gone. Nobody, nobody is beyond God's love. Nobody is beyond God's love, no matter who they are, what they've done, who they've done it to, what's been done to them. They are not beyond God's love. And aren't you glad that God has not given up on you?
Amen? Anybody? Amen. Jesus did for us what religion can't do. You can try and you can work and you can strive and you can study. You can try to believe all the right things and do all the right things. It's not going to change your life. It's a relationship with the living God who comes into your life and frees you from sin and gives you a new life, a new opportunity, and makes you a new creation. And he starts from wherever it is you are. He meets you where you are. He didn't say, measure up, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and now you can come to me. It doesn't work that way. I'm thinking of the words in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever you know, opens that door and invites me and I will come in. And it's just like, sometimes we have this attitude in our life. It's like Jesus knocking on the door of our life and he wants in. He said, I'm not letting you into this mess. Let me clean it up first. You ever had somebody come in unannounced to your house? We did when we had our twin boys at the worst stage possible. And somebody came, can I come in? and say, no, this is a bad time. This is a mess. And that's the way it is with our life. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Jesus wants into your mess. He's the one that can clean up the mess. You don't clean up your mess first and then you get Jesus. You get Jesus and he helps you clean up the mess in your life. You know that, don't you? It's his life in me that's, that's made the difference. It's not that I got this and got that or any. Else, I love Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 in the message version. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion, striving, working? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Jesus wants a relationship with you. That's what he's after. Jesus wants a relationship with you and he wants a relationship with people in our community and they don't know that. They, they just hear the religious stuff about how bad they are and what they're not doing and they need to get this and that. No, there's, there's a God who loves them who gave his life on a cross to demonstrate how much he loves them. That's our message. And it's a powerful message. It's why, it's why he died and what he paid for. He paid for our adoption that we would be born into his, into his family. And how ironic that Jesus pointed to himself, not religion, to do this. When he declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' blood on the cross was the payment for your adoption and mine into God's family. We're now, we're in. That's a whole nother talk on, on that one. But what about those that are far away from God? What about them? And that's where we build bridges. And I want to rise to be a bridge building church, not a barrier building church. We want to make it as easy as possible for people to come to Jesus. And some of you would say, well, what about the narrow way? Jesus is the narrow way. Sometimes we make the way to Jesus even more narrow, sometimes impossible. I'm gonna talk about that in two weeks, about now making it hard for those that are far away and, and building bridges so they can come to know that the God that, that we do. So Jesus died for relationship. It's not based on obeying the rules to forgive you, to change you from the inside out. That's how it works. It's inside out. You know, the prodigal son, how many have ever heard the story of the prodigal son? You know, he messed up, man. I'll, I'm gonna tell that story, that's a fun one. No, he messed up, he took his dad's goods and up yours, dad, and ran away and squandered it and then came to the end of himself and he had nothing to offer. He couldn't give his dad any, he couldn't make up for anything he'd done. He did one thing, my friends, all he did that changed his life, he came home. And I wonder if there's some of you here today, the decision of your life, it's time to come home. 
with your mess, whatever it is comes with you, bring you and whatever is part of, of you. And what we offer people is not religion, but a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. So over the next number of months, as I'm back and forth, and when, when I get to be here uh, with you, you know, in the fall, I just think God has some great, great days ahead for this church. I, I, I think God has already targeted people he wants to not just bring into our meetings, but into our lives. And the key to our future is you and the life that you're living in God, and you invite your friends in. You don't have to have all the answers. It's come and see. It's invite them to come and see and come be partakers of the life that, that you've had. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, even as we heard about Fred's healing and the great news from cancer, Lord, I, I pray, God, that you would, just, you would just sweep over us right now in Jesus' name. Lord, that, Lord, that you bring your healing, your deliverance, your freedom, God. Give us your heartbeat, God. Remind us, Lord, that you found us when we couldn't find you. You came to us. We didn't come to you. You pursued us. You didn't give up on us, God. Lord, I'm wondering if there's someone here that needs to come home. That you would just call them home right now. You'd knock on the door. That they would hear your knock on their heart. And just in this moment, if you'd say, Rick, you know what? I hear you. I'm ready to sur I'm, re I'm ready to surrender my life, to quit living my life. I want what God has for me. I want to come home. I want to come home to him. If that's you, I want to just lead you in a quick prayer. You can pray your own, however it works. If you're wondering just what to do, it's like maybe you start, Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Jesus, I accept what you've done on my behalf. I surrender. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me and make me the new person you've called me to be. I give my life to you, Jesus, because you gave your life first to me. Now we're just this attitude of prayer still keeping if you prayed that prayer this morning, would you just slip up your head as an acknowledgement of your homecoming? Just say, Rick, that's me. I prayed that. God bless you over there. Yes, Lord. Anybody else over here? Yes, over here. Yes, Lord. Who else? Come home. Baggage and all. Junk. Mess. Somebody else, who else? Well, it's time to come home. We bless you, those that are coming home. We welcome you. We welcome you into our mess. <laughs> yeah. And I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us and do the work, Jesus, that only you can do, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If our prayer team would move to the, to the windows as we sing this last song, if you did pray that prayer today, and maybe you prayed it before, but this time 
you know it was the time, then I encourage you to, to come along and, and ask them, let them pray for you. But if there's people on your heart today that you felt like a bit are too far gone, come and get prayer for them. Okay, come and get prayer for them. And also we want, if some of you would like to, to pray uh, for the Moore family, they're going down to LA to Cedar sinai uh, Hospital with their son Aiden and there's some major thing. If you'd like to pray for them, I encourage you, they'll be over here. You guys make your way over here and we wanna pray for them. Let's worship together one last time here. Come for prayer.